Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for The Negotiations, What's on the Table, the fourth briefing in our five-part series, What Congress Needs to Know in the Lead-Up to COP26. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. In a little more than a week, thousands of leaders, diplomats, climate scientists, and stakeholders from across the private and public sectors will descend on Glasgow, Scotland for the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP26. ESI has devoted the entire month of October to providing briefings and related educational resources with the information and insights that members of Congress and their staff need in the lead up to, during, and after COP26. I would like to acknowledge our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington, and our great partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, for their support and cooperation that make this briefing series possible. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. The best way to stay informed about our latest resources is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. The next issue comes out next Tuesday. When COP26 begins, EESI will launch for the first time a special daily newsletter, Glasgow Dispatch, to track the climate talks. Each daily edition will cover U.S. involvement in the negotiations, updates on other countries, and key issue coverage, all with the educational and informational needs of Congress in mind. If you would like to sign up for this new daily newsletter, Glasgow Dispatch, you can subscribe online at www.eesi.org forward slash COP news. We know how much will be happening and all the other demands on staff on, staff on Capitol Hill. So I hope everyone will take full advantage of EESI during this very busy time. Our briefing series began on October 8th with a conversation featuring Sir Robert Watson and Christiana Figueres about the urgency of climate change and reasons for optimism as we face the enormous challenges of global warming and biodiversity loss. On October 15th, we gathered experts in climate adaptation and resilience to discuss the status of various initiatives undertaken or expanded since COP25 in late 2019. And just on Wednesday, our focus was international climate finance and efforts underway to mobilize and leverage investments to advance climate change solutions and accelerate an equitable transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy. If you missed any of the first three briefings in the series, I encourage you to watch the archived webcast and review presentation materials. And of course, everything is available online for free at www.eesi.org. After COP26, we will convene a special briefing on Thursday, November 18th, for an after action report to review key outcomes and discuss possible next steps. Today, the topic will be major issues on the agenda for the negotiations at COP26, and our panelists will help our audience understand these issues in the context of the Paris Agreement and why it matters for US policymakers involved in infrastructure legislation, the reconciliation package, and annual appropriations for federal agencies and international organizations. I'm gonna cut my remarks short today because we have an amazing panel coming up in just a moment. Um, but before I do introduce our first panelist, I'd like to remind everyone that just because you're not with us today in person doesn't mean you still can't participate. We will be taking questions from our online audience and we'll do our best to incorporate them into the discussion. Um, if you have a question that comes up uh, during the session today, you can um, send it to us in two ways. The first is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. You should really do that anyway, but specifically if you have a question, that's one way you can get it to us. You can also send us an email and the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. We may not get to every question submitted, but we'll do our best, like I said, to incorporate them into the discussion. And with that, it is my privilege to introduce uh, our first panelist today. Jennifer Allen is a strategic advisor and team leader with Earth Negotiations Bulletin, as well as a lecturer at Cardiff University. Her work focuses on the global governance of climate change, chemicals, and wastes. Her publications explore the complexities of setting global rules for the environment and the role of non-state actors in negotiation processes. Jen, it's great to see you today. Welcome to the briefing and I'll turn it over to you. Great, 
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just let me quickly share my slides. Great. So this first bit, I really just want to give you sort of almost a COP boot camp in a way. What is COP? What can we expect? And you know, what is sort of the feel for a COP, a big meeting like this? Because these UN climate change meetings are uh, the largest meetings on the UN calendar. So you can expect an awful lot of people to be showing up in Glasgow. So first I'll talk about just what is COP? What does it mean when we keep using those words? Uh, what does it come to mean over time? I'll give you a quick orientation of what the main bodies are that are meeting at COP. And again, sort of that usual rhythm in terms of the day-to-day -day flow of what will happen over the two weeks. So when we say COP, technically that means the conference of the parties it's a governing body for the un convention new york framework oh i'll try again the un framework convention on climate change uh, so we say cop because that's the body that meets but over time it's grown to be so much more than that body that oversees this treaty's implementation uh, negotiations have continually happened. We've added the Kyoto Protocol. We've added the Paris Agreement. We've also, you can think of it like a coral reef, where in addition to that legal body that meets, it's become a place where once a year, everyone working on climate change meets and gathers together, regardless of whether or not they're strictly there for the negotiations. So we see a lot of activists using this as their platform once a year to get their issues across and to try to push for more ambitious climate action. We see that COP has become a forum for mobilizing commitments from cities, from subnational entities like states or provinces, depending on the country, uh, and from the private sector. The private sector often shows up to COP and they will make pledges and they will mobilize and show their support for climate action as well. So it's really become sort of a forum for a lot of different parts of climate action from across society. And because of that, it means that once a year, this is the time that we're all talking about climate change and the media is more engaged and public attention is really focused on the issue in a way that it isn't most of the rest of the year. So COP, while technically it's that one body, it's grown over time to become much, much more. So usually we're getting about 20 to 25,000 people at these COPs now. Uh, ever since 2015, we routinely hit that 20K mark. And even with the pandemic, Glasgow's looking to be quite similar. Registration is about 17, 18,000, the last numbers I saw. And they're starting to cap uh, participation in the venue itself at 10,000 a day for uh, pandemic related reasons to allow for social distancing. And it's because these meetings just have become so huge over time. Which is exactly this. So these huge meetings post Paris, 17, 18, 20,000 people, and it wasn't always like that. So you can see the growth in terms of who participates at these COPs. And, and the blue bars there are the parties and observer states, so countries. Uh, that's roughly even, but you'll see some years that the delegation sizes really go up. Also, you'll see the NGOs, those numbers have gone up quite a bit and a wider range of NGOs now attend than ever before. And there's a lot of different issues that now they're connecting to climate change. So from all sort of types of groups that would attend a COP, it's really growing and that's how it's become the largest event on the UN calendar. I should also say, since we are living through a pandemic right now, this is the first big event to go ahead entirely in person. Other big COPs planned for other environmental issues, such as biodiversity, have been largely postponing their in-person events until 2022. Um, so all eyes are on this from multiple perspectives, including from the UN system to see if it can work and if we can hold big in-person negotiation-based meetings again. So here's what all of those bodies that are going to be meeting over these two weeks in, in person look like. So we have COP, which is the Conference of the Parties. We have CMA, which is for the Paris Agreement. It's a governing body that overviews the Paris Agreement. 
Uh, and then we have the CMP, which is a similar type of body that overviews, oversees the Kyoto Protocol. Um, that one we won't hear as much about because the Kyoto Protocol's last commitment period ended right before Paris Agreement took over. And that was on purpose, that the Paris Agreement is taking over for much of the Kyoto Protocol's work. So those are big governing bodies. They're going to deal with the decision making. They're going to deal with maybe some of the more politically thorny issues. Uh, that's where we'll see the decisions made. Below them, and where they task much of the technical work, is to two bodies that are called SUBSTA and SBI. SUBSTA is the subsidiary body for scientific and technical advice, technological advice. Uh, it's dealing with kind of what the name says, uh, scientific matters, technical matters, maybe around methodological issues, greenhouse gas inventories, reporting frameworks, things of that nature. The subsidiary body for implementation looks at how the convention and the agreement are being implemented. And so it will look at things like reports from some other bodies, like the Adaptation Committee, for example, and it'll make recommendations up to the COP or the CMA as appropriate. The ones in green at the bottom, these won't be meeting during COP, but you'll hear them a lot. You'll hear about the financial mechanism, the adaptation committee, the standing committee on finance. These are constituted bodies and expert groups that meet throughout the year to help do some of that implementation work, to help make sure that the convention and the Paris Agreement are being implemented and support parties while they implement these agreements back home. These bodies have largely been able to meet during the pandemic, but they've been doing it virtually. So it hasn't been 100% perfect, uh, but they have been able to get most, if not all of their meetings in, and they have been able to provide a report and a second of recommendations for those subsidiary bodies to consider and in turn for the COP and the CMA to consider. So that's sort of some of the acronyms that you're going to hear quite a bit of because they'll be the ones meeting uh, throughout the week or the two weeks. Here's kind of what to expect in those two weeks. So week one, we're starting off on the 31st. Uh, we're getting an extra day for this COP uh, because we're starting with a world leaders summit. And this will be uh, one day, I think, although they just announced about 121 speakers. So probably two days. I think we'll have two days of world leaders speaking. And basically they're going to be giving high level speeches. They're going to be talking about maybe what their pledges to the Paris Agreement contain. Re hopefully developed countries will be bringing financial pledges, but that'll be sort of a high level security tight uh, event. Then we'll see all of these bodies, the COP, the CMA, the SUBSTA, the SBI, they're all going to host, uh, hold their opening plenaries. These are uh, surprisingly dull. It really is just a procedural event to kick off the meeting. The main thing is adopting the agenda because that is the list of issues that will be negotiated over the two weeks. And so if uh, some issues are left on the agenda, then they're not talked about. And countries all have to agree to everything in that list. So the agenda is crucial. Once that's adopted, they literally go one by one through each of those items, open them up, establish maybe what's called a contact group or informal consultations. These are small groups that will then meet throughout the first week to try to hash out these issues in some detail. Then there'll be some opening statements and then that's all of the bodies open. All of that is going to happen in the first two days, the World Leader Summit and opening all these bodies because the goal is to allow maximum time from Tuesday to Saturday for the SUBSTA and for the SBI to meet in those small groups and to try to get through the technical work that they've been tasked. And the agendas are full. COP couldn't meet last year because of the pandemic. And some of their work they couldn't complete in 2019 when they were in Madrid. So there's in some cases, three years of work programs to be considering here. So they have an awful lot of technical work to try to plow through. Technically, they end on Saturday. Uh, usually it's very early in the morning Sunday, like more like 4 a.m. ish we get done. Um, and anything that they can't finish, they pass on 
to week two, and they asked the COP or perhaps the CMA to take it on under the presidency's guidance. So anything that they can't get done, it doesn't disappear, it moves on, unless parties can't even agree to do that. And if they're completely stalemated, then something called Rule 16 happens and they just agree to disagree and put it on the agenda for next time. So we hit week two on Monday, and week two is when we're going to see more of the political issues. We're going to have another high-level segment, this time with ministers speaking. And from there, they might get involved in the negotiations, maybe by Thursday, Wednesday night, Thursday. So we'll see issues like finance be raised quite a bit during week two. Other of the more political issues will be brought up, and those leftover issues from the subsidiary bodies. When the ministers get engaged on about Thursday, then sometimes it can be a bit tough to know what's going on uh, because sometimes it's quite, you know, one-on-one -on -one delegation type meetings to broker a deal. And often it involves a package of deals that will happen. Uh, probably we won't be finishing this meeting on time. On time means Friday at six o'clock local time. Um, that's never happened to my knowledge. And uh, I mean, we easily go into Saturday. Occasionally, like 2019, we go into Sunday. So these last minute deals are quite common, partly because it is a package that tends to all be put together at the last minute, or not the last minute, but they take their time to do it. And it seems to all sort of come together somehow in, in the back room somewhere. So don't think that you're off the hook on Friday because you'll probably still be looking at this on Saturday. Um, it does tend to be sort of that political last minute deal. And then we have a closing plenary to wrap it all up where the last decisions are made. And then parties give their closing statements, which is really their initial reflection. So it's a great first litmus test to see how happy parties are or where they're disappointed with what they've come up with over the two weeks. So I'm going to leave it there and let the other speakers go. And then I'm coming back to chat about finance. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jen. Yes, you'll come back after we hear from our, you'll all, you're our first panelist, also our fourth panelist today. So we'll be back with you in a moment. Um, I'm going to now uh, introduce our second panelist. Tracy Bach serves as the co-focal point of research and independent non-governmental organizations to the UNFCCC Secretariat. She is a law professor who has uh, taught and published on climate change, international environmental law and human rights, and healthcare and environmental health law. She has degrees from Yale and the University of Minnesota. Tracy, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for the great introduction. Let me share my screen as well. Well, Jen has set the table for us, which is just fantastic. And my, what I get to do is focus on a very relatively narrow slice of what's on the table at COP26. But what I want to do is, uh, you can all see that well, I'm going to make you all go away for a moment. There we go. Um, is focus on, first of all, understanding what NDCs are. So I'm sure by now, as Hill staffers, you have heard the, the acronym NDCs or Nationally Determined Contributions. Um, those are a, what I think of as the backbone of the Paris Agreement. So on the left-hand side of the bullets, I wanna build up to it to, um, to add to Jen's introduction of the institutions, um, the governance institutions and the treaties like the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, because often when we think of the Paris Agreement, many don't understand that the Paris Agreement is under the UNFCCC's umbrella. And so when we think of NDCs, I'm gonna encourage you all when watching their um, negotiation at this COP, but also the political actions on them at this COP, I'm gonna encourage you to reach back and think about how these NDCs build on, particularly articles four and 12 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UNFCCC, in those where those commitments and reporting articles um, that did create commitments to, um, to share information between countries, just not targets, which is where the Kyoto Protocol added with its mitigation targets, or what were called quantified emission limitation and reduction commitments, easier to say targets. So we know that the um, 
protocol has functionally sunsetted at this point because with the Paris Agreement, specifically uh, starting in 2020, the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, are to set out each country's uh, defined contribution to, to what? What you see on the right-hand side of the screen under um, Paris Agreement Article 3 as nationally determined contributions to the global response to climate change. That's what we're working toward. All parties are to undertake and communicate ambitious efforts as defined in Articles 4, so that's the mitigation article, Article 7, adaptation, Article 9, finance, Article 10, capacity building, Article 11, uh, technology transfer and development, and Article 13 on transparency, another way of saying reporting. And they're communicating these ambitious efforts with a view to achieving the purpose of Article 2 in the agreement. And that's where, by now, everybody's heard the phrase well below 2C, one of the temperature goals, but it's also with the aim of trying to keep us closer to 1.5. So the key thing about these NDCs is that next sentence that I folded, the efforts of all parties, not just the developed parties as were the Kyoto Protocol targets applied to, but all parties will represent a progression over time. At the same time, recognizing the need to support developing countries who haven't had these types of quantitative, uh, in particular, mitigation targets to meet, contributions to meet. Okay, so hopefully I've pitched the idea that the NDCs don't come out of nowhere under the Paris Agreement. They actually build on the UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol's um, uh, evolving approach to mitigation and adaptation. So I do want to, the third bullet, you're going to hear a lot, especially in the United States, about how the Paris Agreement is a bottom-up agreement. The idea versus top-down of the Kyoto Protocol, which had a common collective around 5% reduction in a commitment period off of a baseline of uh, 1990 of, of greenhouse gas emissions. In contrast, what is different about the NDCs under the Paris Agreement is that each party, as I just read in Article 3, and as it references and intersects with those other articles, has the shall requirement to submit, to prepare and submit an NDC every five years. Um, but they define, each party defines what they will do in those five years. And that's what makes it bottom up, when many people say. Um, the other piece about that is you may have heard about differentiation under the UNFCCC. In Article 3, the principal section, there's the common but different responsibilities and respective capabilities or capacities, CBDRC, recognizing that one, there are historical polluters, and so arguably they have put more carbon dioxide up to the atmosphere and thus are more responsible for it. Two, there's the other differentiation by wealth and technological capacity, the idea being that if you have more wealth, that you have more responsibility because of your ability to address the problem. So that differentiation we'll come back to and that you'll see play out at COP26. Last two points I want to make before turning to what's on the table is um, that it's very important when thinking about the NDCs and when tracking the negotiations at COP26 in Glasgow that you keep in mind the Article 13 Enhanced Transparency Framework, it's called, or ETF sometimes. Um, but the idea is that's where reporting is going on. And for me, I'm always looking, when I'm looking at what's being negotiated about what should be in an NDC, I'm always pairing that with what then a country who submits their NDC then has obligations under Article 13 to report out on them. So keep those two in mind and link them. And the final link would be what I think of as with NDCs as the backbone of the Paris Agreement and Article 13's transparency as a core um, process requirement and ambition driver, that Article 14's global stock take is every five year session where all parties to the Paris Agreement review a, a range of documentation that looks at the cumulative progress over time toward that Article 2 temperature goal and take stock of whether how close they are or not. Note, I keep saying cumulative and all parties. The Article 4 global stock tape is not meant to be individual uh, review of a country's progress. That's 
that's coming out through MRV requirements in Article 13. But this is a cumulative uh, stock take that then says, okay, we as a world or parties to the Paris Agreement have not achieved well below 2C. What more do each of us have to do to increase our ambition? This graphic from the World Resources Institute is one I love to share with people to show this ambition cycle that you're seeing negotiated at COP26. So notice it starts with the adoption of the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015. And notice how 2020 was that uh, date that is a, a milestone for communicating new or updated NDCs. Just a quick going back behind 2015, almost all countries filed what were called uh, intended I NDCs. And, and that helped set the negotiating table. And when they ratified or you know, submitted their articles of ratification, to the UN to be bound by the Paris Agreement, those countries had a choice. They could communicate new or updated NDCs then, or they could simply say, no, we'll stick with our INDC to 2020. Most countries stuck with their INDCs, essentially waived their wand, and converted them to real NDCs. And so 2020 is slash was the year to update that. That was to have happened at COP26, which as we all know, was intended to happen last year at this time. Um, and so that's why COP26, I um, would argue to you that when we're talking about NDCs, that what's on the table is more about the politics of getting countries to communicate these more ambitious NDCs uh, versus the negotiations of the specifics of the uh, Paris rulebook to define what the NDCs look like. Last thing I want to point out on this slide, as parties to the Paris Agreement make their way to the Article 4, goal of uh, mid-century net zero emissions and climate resilience, that the way the um, NDCs and the global stock take work is you have the NDCs work with 2020, now it's going to be more 2021, and then three years later, mid-cycle, before you have to file a new NDC every five years, the global stock take takes place. And as I said a moment ago, at the stock take, all parties will decide how much more each party needs to commit to um, to uh, reach the Article 2 well, Article 2 well below 2C goals or really striving for 1.5C. So see how this happens over time. And the idea is some people call it the ambition cycle, some people call it a ratchet. But the idea is that through this process of filing new, more ambitious NDCs, and then taking cumulative stock as the parties to the Paris Agreement on whether or not we've achieved the Article 2 goals, then we'll know how to ratchet up or increase the ambition of individual countries, NDCs. So when we look at the political context of COP26, COP26, what we see is that a number of countries have submitted revised or new NDCs. And this is uh, data taken from Climate Action Tracker, an NGO, I recommend uh, bookmarking their site and keeping track of it. They assess um, uh, NDCs with respect to not only the actual content of it here on the right side of the screen, you see the comparison of the uh, former US NDC and the brand new one, so 2016 versus 2021. And um, what they do, what they have shown is that a number of countries have proposed uh, and submitted uh, stronger targets, others have not. So that is something to keep an eye on because that is a major diplomatic ambition of the UK presidency is to get um, more NDC, new NDCs announced, and to have most, if not all of them, to have stronger targets, so submitted stronger targets. In my last one minute with you right now, and of course I'm happy to answer any questions, um, I'm going to call your attention to this report that came out just about a little over a month ago by the Secretariat. It's what's called a synthesis report, and what they did is they looked at the NDCs, the new NDCs that had been um, um, filed. Uh, there's a public registry for them. You can find them on the UNFCCC website. And, and, and that was through July, end of July. So it's always a little dated. But uh, there were some 86 new and updated NDCs from 113 parties. They cover about 93% of global um, greenhouse gas emissions. The good news is they represent a 12% decrease by 2030. So the um, NDCs, the the contributions that individual countries, these individual countries had made. As you can see in that red kind of triangle in the graphic on the right, um, they have they represent 
a decrease from what would have happened by 2030 absent those NDCs. But of course, the glass half empty part of this is what you see below that red triangle. There's still a long way to go, and I'm ha happy to talk about this more when answering questions, because I do want to get to the last slide I have to share with you today, which is looking at what I would call the treaty context versus the political context. So this is what is literally on the negotiation table under the Paris rulebook, and it's called common timeframes. And it's a relatively straightforward idea, right, that right now we have NDCs from uh, many, many countries that are on different timeframes. Some have a different baseline year, some have a different out year, 2025, 2030. Um, and so the parties are still negotiating. They have agreed that beginning in 2031, so in the next NDC cycle, um, starting in 2031, those NDCs will have to be on a common time frame that the parties agree to in the Paris rulebook, but they have not agreed. And that's what is the main negotiating item that you could follow and especially through the US delegation who's negotiating on it, see where they are going. The other thing I wanna point out in that lower part of the right-hand screen is that while this is a narrow question in some ways, it obviously has huge impacts on our ability to compare what countries are doing and to do good global stock takes. So um, one is, you know that Article 6, the market mechanisms, which we'll get to next in the webinar, um, it would they would be easier to understand and to follow and to track, to monitor and review if they were based on NDCs that had common timeframes. Likewise, the biennial transparency reports that would be required of parties under Article 13, that ETF, the Enhanced Transparency Framework, that would be easier if they had common timeframes. And of course, I've already mentioned the global stock take. So in sum, this last slide is, is narrow, but has tentacles across the major components of the Paris Agreement. And so watching this particular agenda item on the NDC negotiation is worthwhile. But in the grand scheme of things, that's why you saw more slides on it, the real um, object with NDCs at COP26 is to achieve what you saw on that time frame for 2020, because we're a year behind and a pandemic uh, uh, recovering from. And so what we're looking for is the political speeches like at the high level segment or the World Leaders Summit that Jen mentioned, uh, where they announce new and more ambitious NDCs. And with that, I'll stop, pass the baton to Article 6. Thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you very much for that very clear explanation. And um, also a good reminder, uh, Tracy just presented some very nice slides with lots of great information. Jen did the same thing, Derek's about to. Um, so if anyone would like to go back and revisit the slides, in addition to the archived webcast being available online at www.esi.org, can also read, uh, review all of the presentation materials. In fact, they're already posted. Um, so not to steal any of Derek's thunder, but um, all of that is um, um, available online, of course. Um, before I introduce Derek, I would just like to remind everyone if they have a question, um, there are two ways to ask it. The first is by uh, following us on Twitter at EESI online. Um, the second way is to send us an email. The email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. And we're getting, a, we're getting a bunch, so we really appreciate it. And I think we'll, we'll find ways to incorporate um, several of them into the Q&A. Um, our third panelist today is Derek Rukoff. Derek is a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environmental, Environment Institute. With over 20 years of experience in energy and climate policy, his current work focuses on the effective design and implementation of environmental market mechanisms in assessing subnational and local climate mitigation policies. He has advised numerous state, local, or state, national, multinational policy initiatives related to carbon markets, greenhouse gas accounting, and low carbon development. Derek, welcome to the briefing today. I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, thanks for the uh, opportunity to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk about Article 6, um, perhaps uh, the big story of the last two COPs, COP 24 and 25, uh, was the failure of negotiators to reach agreement on Article 6. Um, and so it's, it's back on the agenda this time at COP 26. So what I'm going to do is dive in a bit, uh, a bit of a deep dive on what Article 6 is, uh, why it matters, and what the issues are uh, that, are, that have held up negotiations so far, um, where, we, where, where they might land in uh, Glasgow. 
Um, so what is Article 6? Uh, it's a section of the Paris Agreement that formally recognizes the possibility for countries to voluntarily cooperate in the achievement of their NDCs um, that Tracy just talked about uh, with the idea of allowing for higher ambition, right? So the idea is that countries can jointly come together uh, to reach their common NDC goals and achieve economies uh, through that cooperation that would allow them to uh, raise the bar going forward in terms of uh, setting more aggressive emission reduction targets. Um, and so it's largely, uh, you know, when we talk about international cooperation, um, in effect, what we're talking about in most cases here is international emissions trading. Um, so there are three sections of Article 6 uh, that set out three different mechanisms by which cooperation, cooperation could occur. The first is Article 6.2, um, and that's basically recognizing um, uh, voluntary arrangements between two or more countries uh, that could take place uh, where they voluntarily agree to um, engage in trades uh, or transfers of mit what are called mitigation outcomes. Uh, and so these arrangements would not be centrally administered. Um, they'd basically be set up by the countries themselves. But Article 6.2 sets out some principles uh, and uh, uh, you know, general uh, criteria under which those, those arrangements could happen. Article 6.4 establishes a separate mechanism. Uh, this would be a centrally administered mechanism for the creation and transfer of emission reduction credits. Uh, so if you're familiar with the Kyoto Protocol and the Clean Development Mechanism, which was this global carbon offsetting program that was established under Kyoto, Article 6.4 is basically the successor to that. Um, and it would be centrally administered uh, and it would allow, for example, countries that may not have the capacity to develop uh, full-fledged emissions trading systems to still participate in these international cooperative arrangements. And then finally, Article 6.8, uh, would recognize opportunities for non-market approaches. That is, um, you could have arrangements where one country might agree to invest in climate change mitigation efforts in another country. Um, it might be, the funding may be contingent upon the performance of those mitigation activities, uh, but there would no, be no transfer of the mitigation outcomes to the funding country. Uh, those emission reductions, for example, would stay in the country uh, where the activities are going on. Um, so it's a kind of uh, climate finance that's anticipated there. So why does Article 6 matter? Um, I would say first and foremost, it's a foundation for cooperation. Um, it's probably not overstating things too much to say that uh, you know, the symbolic value here is uh, as important as anything else. Um, that is, uh, it lays a foundation for uh, cooperative approaches um, and a failure to reach agreement here would uh, you know, cast a pall, I think, over future efforts at, uh, you know, a collective response to climate change, which ultimately is what we need. Um, but the key motivating idea here is this idea of gains from trade, this idea that, um, you know, each country trying to achieve their NDCs individually on their own um, could do that, but it could be much more cost effective um, to achieve that same level of emission reductions collectively if countries are allowed to um, you know, trade uh, mitigation outcomes, essentially. And there have been a study or two trying to quantify that potential there, suggesting that um, you know, we could achieve 50% more reductions than are in the current NDCs in 2030 um, for the same cost if you implemented a kind of global emissions trading system. So, um, and then, of course, you know, that kind of hot topic on the table these days and going into COP26 is this idea of net zero. Globally, we have to get to net zero emissions around the middle of the century. That means balancing emissions with carbon dioxide removal. And if you're thinking about how to efficiently achieve that balance across the world, carbon markets are probably uh, the most effective, efficient way to do that. And it's important to get that foundation correct. Um, and then finally, just business opportunities. Um, you know, even when the United States did not participate directly in the Kyoto Protocol, for example, um, U.S. businesses uh, were front and center in engaging in these markets, um, making these clean energy investments um, under this market mechanism that was established under Kyoto. The same uh, could uh, kinds of opportunities could be available uh, under the Paris Agreement 
with an agreement on Article 6. So what are the issues? Um, there are really two big ones, I would say. One is coming to an agreement um, on uh, how to avoid double counting emission reductions. So just to be clear, when we say um, negotiators have failed to reach agreement, what they have failed to reach agreement on is essentially what's called the rule book uh, for how these mechanisms uh, should be implemented. Um, and in particular, the accounting that needs to be done to ensure that these mechanisms are effective. Um, so avoiding double counting um, has been a real hang up in the negotiations so far. Uh, the other big issue is what to do about all these Kyoto era emission reduction credits. So the Kyoto Protocol established this kind of global emissions trading system. Um, it generated a lot of emission reduction credits that are basically still out there, unsold, unbought. Um, and there's a big question about um, can they be recognized in that Paris regime? Um, so that's uh, a, a roadblock in the negotiations as well. Also on the agenda um, is this question of adaptation financing. So um, there's a stipulation that for Article 6.4, every time a credit is generated and sold, that a share of the proceeds from those sales goes into this global adaptation funds. Uh, and there's a question of whether that should apply to Article 6.2 as well. Um, and I put an asterisk here because I think if you talk to the negotiators, they would actually say this is um, uh, actually a top tier issue, um, one of the big three. Um, and uh, to some extent, that's true. I think it's it, the, the challenge here is that it's connected to other negotiating streams around climate finance and adaptation finance. And I think it's a bit of a bargaining chip within the context of Article 6. Um, and in short, I would say, um, you know, my opinion, but my sense is if the negotiators reach an agreement on these first two issues, double counting and Kyoto credits, um, that we're not going to see a breakdown in the outcome over this adaptation financing question. They'll find a solution to that. Whereas the reverse is not true. I think if negotiators can't get to agreement on those first two issues, we could again see a breakdown in the negotiations and a failure um, to, to get an agreement on the rule book again. Um, some other issues being negotiated are uh, some details around the crediting rules and standards for that Article 6, 6 6.4 mechanism. Um, and then this question, there's this language in the Paris Agreement related to Article 6.4 saying that um, this mechanism has to um, deliver an overall mitigation in global emissions. And the negotiators are still talking about what that means exactly, and also whether it should uh, also apply to Article 6.2. Um, that's one of the hangups here. So diving in a bit uh, on these, on the big issues, um, double counting, um, you know, in some ways this is really simple and even this diagram here over complicates it. Um, you know, the basic idea is that no two countries should be counting the same emission reductions towards achievement of their NDCs. Um, and that may seem obvious, right? So, um, that, you know, if, if that happens, then the world would be better, better off if countries simply achieved um, their NDCs individually and didn't count uh, reductions in, in another country. Um, so, you know, within an, an international trading system, the idea is there has to be some kind of uh, accounting system in place. The idea is that you could have country A, the seller country, uh, maybe overachieving against their NDC target, their emission reduction target um, here by 30 tons. So they then have 30 extra tons that they could transfer to a buyer country uh, who maybe doesn't quite get all the way to their emissions target, but because they can uh, acquire these emission reductions from the first country, they can claim to have met their target. Um, both countries nominally meet their target and um, you know, uh, the atmosphere sees the same level of emissions as if they had done everything by themselves. Um, the term of art within the uh, negotiations is that uh, these countries would apply what are called corresponding adjustments, that is accounting adjustments in their ledgers used to track their progress towards the achievement of their NDC targets um, and uh, sort things out that way. Um, so that sounds straightforward. Um, I, at least, you know, the, the idea that you shouldn't have double counting seems obvious. Um, so what, what are the issues here? Uh, well, there are some complications. Um, the first is that uh, NDCs, you know, as Tracy was alluding to, come in all shapes and sizes. 
Um, it's a bottom-up approach. Um, so the motivating idea here is each country gets to specify in their own terms what they're going to contribute to climate change mitigation. Um, and this means we have all kinds of targets specified uh, for single years. So there's a question of how you sort out the accounting in the interim years leading up to, say, 2025 or 2030 when these targets are set. Some countries have renewable energy generation targets, so it's not even specified in greenhouse gas reductions, or they promise to do some things without quantitative metrics attached. Um, so that creates challenges. The solutions are mostly technical, um, and I think can be sorted out. The big issue in the negotiations here is this second issue, which is what to do about mitigation that may occur, may occur outside the scope of a country's NDC. So not every country has set an economy-wide greenhouse gas emission reduction target. In many cases, they focus on particular sectors. Um, and you can argue that if mitigation is occurring outside those sectors um, and it's transferred, that there's no actual double counting going on, right? It's not occurring within the scope of the NDC. Two big challenges there. One is it's not always easy to determine what's inside or outside. Um, and the other issue that's pertinent for the goals of the Paris Agreement are, are that, you know, if you allow those transfers to occur, then the countries that do not have economy-wide NDCs um, have a disincentive against expanding the scope of their NDCs over time because then they'll have to start accounting for these transfers. Um, so it creates this kind of perverse incentive against this raising of ambition idea um, and so that solution you know, that's more or less a consensus solution at this point, at least for Article 6.2, um, is a, a kind of Gordian knot approach that says, okay, we're gonna apply corresponding adjustments in all cases, um, whether it's inside or outside, and just get rid of this potential disincentive. Um, but like I said, that's the consensus for Article 6.2 for some, uh, it's rather arcane reasons related to the wording in the Paris Agreement. Um, it's not clear if that same approach should apply to Article 6.4. Um, and you have a couple of countries, Brazil in particular, India as well, um, arguing that, uh, you know, fine, that's a fine approach for Article 6.2, but on Article, Article 6.4, it really does matter whether the mitigation occurs inside or outside of the scope of the NDC. Corresponding adjustments should not be required for mitigation occurring outside. Um, and oh, by the way, um, Brazil has a very generous interpretation for what it means for mitigation to be outside the scope. Um, so that's that's the hang up here. No one is actually saying um, that double counting is okay and it should be allowed. It's kind of a difference in perspective. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, in so many words, um, Brazil and India are arguing for an approach that would uh, you know, tacitly allow for double counting to occur um, uh, without getting into all the thorny detailed accounting questions. So what are the possible outcomes? Um, you know, there is some indication that Brazil may be backing off its hardline stance that it's taken in the last two negotiations um, and prevented a consensus on the rule book here. Um, but it could be that, uh, you know, we end in kind of a, a landing zone where you have some flexibility that tacitly allows double counting for a limited period and maybe put some constraints on uh, this perverse incentive issue, you know, what counts as inside or outside the scope of the NPCs. So next big issue uh, is this issue of the carryover of these Kyoto era um, credits uh, for emission reductions. Um, you know, essentially we have this really long market. Um, and the issue here is essentially Countries have specified these NDCs, these targets for reducing emissions, but in, I would say, nearly all cases, um, they have not set those targets anticipating that they would be able to kind of use all the, this huge backlog of credits. Um, we're talking billions of tons here um, towards the achievement of those uh, NDCs. Um, and so the concern is that if you allow all these units to carry forward, um, essentially it would allow collectively countries to relax their efforts in actually getting you know, the emission reductions that their NDCs uh, imply. Um, and means, you know, essentially it will delay action even further in terms of getting to real emission reductions. Um, it's sort of all on paper at this point because those credits represent emission reductions that have already occurred. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, there's questions about whether they even occurred at all, um, given some of the concerns around the Kyoto Protocol uh, clean development mechanism and, 
in the accounting approaches there. Um, so it's an issue with big environmental integrity implications, uh, but of course you can understand from the point of view of the countries um, that are trying to sell these credits or the private sector actors in many cases, they have an interest in seeing um, uh, some recognition uh, and, and value to those credits. So that's essentially what's at stake here. Um, there's two, there's a couple issues here. Um, so one is transitioning the credits themselves. There's a separate question around transitioning the mitigation projects that generated the credits can they continue to receive credits going forward? But it's all essentially the same question of, um, you know, how far this sets back progress in actually reducing emissions uh, versus balancing the interests of the folks who made these investments prior. Um, you know, in terms of who's on which side in the negotiations, it's you know, US, EU, um, uh, and some other countries that oppose carryover. Uh, but you have like Brazil, India, China, and Australia, for example, arguing that there should be at least some carryover. Um, where might things land? Uh, again, probably some kind of compromise here, perhaps limiting uh, you know, that pool of credits that can be transferred over um, uh, in the projects themselves. Um, it's possible, um, I suppose, to see these units put into some kind of reserve that might be drawn upon if um, mitigation costs become too high. We'll see if that happens. Um, but that, you know, I, I, probably the most likely outcome is some compromise around that would allow limited carryover, um, but set some real constraints around it. So other issues, um, one is this adaptation finance issue I alluded to. Um, again, it, the real question here is um, whether this share of proceeds that stipulated for Article 6.4 should also apply to Article 6.2 transfers, which are not centrally administered. Um, you know, one concern is that this requirement uh, creates an uneven playing field, so it would be better if we had sort of the same rules for everything. Um, but there are concerns among some parties, including the United States, that that could set up roadblocks for 6.2 cooperation. Um, and uh, you know the argument is essentially there are these separate tracks addressing adaptation and climate finance, and this issue should really be addressed there. Um, but there are folks, especially in the developing country negotiating blocks, um, that want to see a steady stream of committed financing, and this is one way to kind of lock in that stream of adaptation finance. And so that's what's on the table. Um, and then there's this OMGE thing, the overall mitigation of global emissions. Um, how most people are interpreting that is, uh, you know, if you look at uh, these transfers that might occur, uh, you know, going back to that illustration, if there are 30 tons that are transferred from country A, uh, OMGE would mean that country B only receives 20 tons, right? So there'd be 10 tons that basically go to uh, you know, contributing to extra mitigation above and beyond what countries are counting in their NDCs, and that's called an overall mitigation of global emissions. Um, it's a way to kind of leverage these markets to raise ambition, um, but it's only stipulated for Article 6.4. Again, the question is, should we create a level playing field and do the same thing for Article 6.2? Um, most likely, what, where things will land is an agreement that uh, encourages um, the application of both of these things to Article 6.2, but doesn't actually require them, uh, but might require some monitoring and reporting, you know, requiring countries to report whether they're actually doing it or not, um, to at least provide some transparency there. Um, and then finally, um, Article 6.4 rules and standards, this is mostly technical stuff, um, but the motivating idea here is let's not repeat some of the same mistakes that plagued um, the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, you know, there's some studies suggesting that maybe up to 70% of the credits issued under that program uh, did not represent real additional emission reductions. Um, they probably would have happened anyway. Um, it's a fuzzy number, uh, but it's a concern for the integrity of these markets. And so there's um, some uh, interest, again, primarily US, EU, in having these rules be fairly robust. Uh, and that's that's on the table as well. So looking forward, uh, one thing that's important to note here is that you know we're talking about the rule book. Uh, this will lay a foundation for international cooperation, but it's still 
uh, and it's important to have that foundation. Uh, but it's still to be determined, you know, how much these different mechanisms will be taken up by countries um, and how much international cooperation we'll see. Um, and the big question is how and whether countries will use Article 6 to eff effectively raise global ambition and not just use it as a way to more cheaply achieve what they've already committed to do. Um, and that's going to be a big kind of policy question going forward. Uh, it's going to require ongoing efforts, I would say, to continue to build trust, uh, institutional capacity, um, and uh, you know, building some of these networks, I would say, at bilateral and regional levels. Um, uh, you know, before we even get to a, a global system. So um, I will leave it there. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, let me know if anything was not clear in what I presented. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And oh, we will definitely get to questions. But before we do, we are going to turn back to Jen, our first panelist. Um, uh, Jen Allen is a strategic advisor and team leader with Earth Negotiations Bulletin. Jen, I'll welcome you back to the panel. I think you have some um, additional comments you'd like to share about climate finance. Thanks, yeah, and, and this will be fairly brief, just mostly to give people an idea of the extent of all the finance issues that are on this very packed agenda. So, uh, there we go. Uh, so why do we need climate finance um, beyond all of the promises and rules that we have to provide it? It's largely because we developed countries, I should say, uh, industrialized using fossil fuels. And now we're asking developing countries to undertake a different model of development that doesn't use fossil fuels while feeding their populations and trying to lift people out of poverty. So it, we're asking them essentially to use an untested model of development in a globalized world. And so for that ask, uh, comes finance and technological support and capacity building support, which those three things together, the finance, the technology, and the capacity building are often called means of implementation. So generally, these means of implementation and finance also specifically goes for support to reduce emissions. So developing countries are developing in a way that also reduces their emissions and for adaptation to build resilience to the effects of climate change because more and more we're seeing that climate change is already having significant impacts on people and there's economic hits there as well i should also add that there's a third pillar called loss and damage which is permanent effects of climate change this could be from a rapid onset event like a extreme weather event where uh, maybe cities are lost, lives are lost, economic activity is lost, uh, or slow onset events. So you could think of maybe sea level rise for a small island state or a low or a delta, like in Bangladesh, where land is being lost, or salt water is permeating freshwater drinking sources. So these are permanent effects of climate change. And increasingly, especially in that second week, what we'll hear is calls for finance to support loss and damage. So finance is on the agenda across a lot of these items to support developing country action. This is a longstanding demand of developing countries that in exchange for their action, and they're already doing a lot, they need the support in order to continue to act on climate change. So countries said uh, 10 years ago, that they would provide $100 billion a year by 2020. Uh, it would either be provided or mobilized, meaning that the country would mobilize, say, private sector investment. Uh, 10 years on, and the deadline is passed, we haven't met the goal. So this graph here is from the OECD that calculates climate finance flows, and we're shy of 80 billion. And, and the thing is that strikes me about this graph is that it's pretty stagnant. 2018 took, looks a lot like 2019. Um, so it's not like this has been sort of steadily growing and we're almost there. And so this is a, it's a matter of trust essentially in the negotiations that developing countries are starting to say, well, why would we take on more reporting requirements, for example, when, we don't know if there's support to help us for that. 
And why are we taking on more commitments at a time when developed countries haven't met this longstanding promise? So it's really becoming crucial for an issue in the negotiations, one of those cornerstone issues that if this continues to fester, it will start to permeate the negotiation dynamics in other areas. Part of the, the sticking point as well with this 100 billion goal is that a lot of it is coming in the forms of loans that have to be paid back rather than in the forms of grants. And so it's actually increasing the debt burden of a lot of developing countries as well. So part of their call is also to kind of start rebalancing that towards grants. We've seen a little bit of movement on this in recent weeks. So the US has promised that it will put in an additional 11.4 billion by 2024. And uh, the EU has said that it will put in an additional 4.7 billion up to 2027, which will add up to about 25 billion a year. So we are seeing some movement on this, uh, maybe not still enough to get us quite to that 100 billion goal. So amongst all those leaders, uh, statements, hopefully there will be financial pledges coming. And that might actually tell us what kind of COP we're in for. But like I said, this is a packed agenda and finance is such a key cornerstone of it that there are a lot of other financial agenda items and priorities at this meeting. And, and almost all of these will be negotiated in the second year or second week, sorry. Might feel like a year, but the second week. Uh, one will be providing guidance to the Global Environmental Facility and to the Green Climate Fund. These two things together, these two organizations, form the financial mechanism. So they're two operating entities of the financial mechanism. And they work for and sort of at the behest of the COP and the CMA. So the COP gives them guidance, essentially. Here's what we would like your priorities to be while you're spending uh, all of the developed countries' money while you're distributing climate finance. So they provide this guidance. They haven't been able to because of the pandemic. So they have to do that this COP. For the first time ever, uh, there will be reports, which I think is already on the UNFCCC website, uh, that is an assessment of developing countries' needs. And it's the first time that they've put this report together. Uh, the Standing Committee on Finance has been working on this not without sort of some controversies because loss and damage was excluded from the report despite strong calls from the African group to put it in. Um, but it will give us a sense for the first time of what level of finance we might actually be looking at here in terms of what developing countries need. There will also be uh, a report published that provides another overview of climate finance flows. You might wonder why we need more because the OECD has crunched numbers already. Uh, one of the tricks of this is that there isn't actually uh, an agreed definition of what climate finance is. So uh, depending on who's counting and how they're defining it, the numbers vary. So the UNFCCC will put out its own report, I think again from the Standing Committee on Finance, of what climate finance looks like. And it also will be breaking it down by things like grants versus loans. So there's a huge amount of finance happening. And it's going to be a really busy part of the agenda for the last two weeks or for the last week and absolutely guaranteed finance will be a crucial part of that last package of decisions that come together. So thank you very much uh, and I will hand back I think to Dan now. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jen, for that. Um, a lot of issues have come up today. Um, our session uh, goes until 2.30. There's obviously a ton um, of, of things that will be discussed. Um, just as a quick reminder, um, we had a uh, briefing last Friday about climate adaptation, um, specifically in the issues that will be sort of discussed at COP26. And we had one just on Wednesday um, about international climate finance. And that issue that Jen just mentioned, what is international climate finance? What counts and what doesn't count was a, a major topic of discussion um, amongst our panelists. So if you'd like to go into uh, depth um, around adaptation or finance um, or even biodiversity loss, um, we've covered them in our briefings recently in the lead up to COP26. So I encourage everyone to visit us online at www.eesi.org. Also sign up for our newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, and our new daily newsletter, um, Glasgow Dispatch, that will be um, issued every day during COP. 
Um, we are now going to transition to Q&A, so I invite um, Jen and Derek and Tracy to turn their um, um, videos back on, and also my colleague Anna McGinn. Um, you might remember Anna, she joined me on Friday for the briefing about adaptation, and she is back. She's our policy manager here at EESI, and she will be leading our Q&A today with our great panelists. So, Anna, welcome to the briefing, and take it away. Great, thanks Dan. Um, really excited about this Q&A. Um, we're hoping to dive into even more of the areas of the negotiations that we uh, haven't covered yet. And uh, with that, I'll just jump right in. So um, we heard Jen mention the term loss and damage. And so I wanna get into that a little bit more. Um, what do we expect to see on loss and damage at COP26? um and kind of maybe a little bit more on um why that's important to the different parties that will be present um so maybe tracy we could start with you and then we can jump to uh jen and derek thanks thanks anna um well i think jen got it right so loss and damage is that permanent loss that um, one cannot adapt to that countries cannot adapt to and we tend to think about it in um, sudden events quite honestly and that's a pretty myopic view but you know sudden um, extreme weather events and those losses. Um, but I tend to think of them in terms of sea level rise and Kiribati and the loss of not only land, but sovereignty, sovereign land, um, ways of life, traditional hunting and fishing, or not even traditional, right? Just long held ways in which people have nourished themselves and um, labored. So those are the kinds of issues that sit within the structure that's called the WIM, Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, that was created back in the Warsaw COP, COP19, uh, two years before Paris, to essentially be that committee, if you will, a processing entity for the parties um, to um, make recommendations to the COP about how to proceed on loss and damage. Um, so I know, I mean, Jen, Jen's point in relating it to finance, I think that's the major thing. So for years of um, one of the breakthroughs of the Paris Agreement for those who were um, advocating for attention and, and remedies, quite honestly, for loss and damage, um, was the creation of uh, what is it, Article 8, which is on loss and damage. Uh, prior to that, loss and damage had always been treated by the UNFCCC as a sub-issue under adaptation. So Paris represented a, a, a stepwise change that way. So then the next step, still governed by the activities at the Warsaw uh, WIM, XCOM, it's called Executive Committee, is about the request for financing and separate financing. Um, that sense of liability between developed and developing country was roundly rejected uh, when the Paris Agreement was adopted in that decision one. I forget which paragraph it is, paragraph 50 something probably, John, right? Um, but it was, it was, um, unmitigated in saying, no, this does not, in adopting Article 8, does not mean that uh, developed countries are liable to developing countries for climate change, loss of damage. But the strategy at this point is to go into the individual conversations, like in finance, and to propose ways, um, um, to come up with creative ways to do financing specifically for loss and damage. And then I guess it would also be the Santiago Network. So out of uh, COP25, a, a network to educate people about, uh, educate countries about loss and damage and to share exchange, um, that is being stood up at this point. Those are the two things I can think of. I'd be curious what other folks have to say. Jen or Derek, do you have um, anything you'd like to add on that one? No, I think Tracy's got it on that, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so the next question we have for you all is, um, of course, we have a lot of congressional staff that are tuning in today, um, and they might be interested in tracking specific topic areas that perhaps align uh, with the work they're doing on Capitol Hill. So it could be agriculture, land use, adaptation, energy, maybe ocean issues. Are there specific, uh, I mean, I just listed a lot of things, but um, could you generally provide kind of guidance on if they're interested in one of those topics, kind of how to tune in, are there specific areas the negotiations keep track of or other areas of the COP that they should keep track of? And more broadly, any ideas that you have um, for congressional staff on effectively engaging with COP26? Um, Jen, maybe we could start with you and then we'll jump to uh, Derek and then Tracy. 
Sure. Yeah. And there are a range of issues that even aren't on the formal agenda that the COP presidency is keen to put forward. Uh, I think now it's coal, cars, cash, and trees or something is the tagline. Um, and so I'd recommend a few. So one is the official UNFCCC website, and there will be information there about engaging virtually uh, to the extent some events are webcast, for example, but also the COP presidency's website because they will have those more thematic uh, initiatives that they're trying to launch around uh, coalitions for moving past coal or the Beyond Oil and Gas Coalition that might be launched. Um, and I guess I should say my own, uh, the Earth Negotiations mm -hmm. Bulletin. Uh, we provide a daily report of what happens in the negotiations. So as much as we can, a who said what uh, type of product. So we don't leave the venue until it's published. So it's out every day. Um, yeah, I didn't, I'm not sure I have too much to add other than, uh, you know, a big part of COPS is, uh, is not just the negotiations, but also the side events. Um, and I would expect, um, you know, a lot of the side events this year uh, to have kind of a virtual attendance option for them. Um, so definitely check out the agenda of side events there, which, uh, you know, they, they cover sort of every issue uh, under the sun, including uh, land use, agriculture, forestry, uh, and, and uh, all those kinds of issues uh, as they relate to the negotiations. So um, yeah, look, look there as well. And I would just add, um, I think, two kind of deeper dive points, which is if you go to the UNFCCC website, as Jen was recommending, um, one, you'll find the link to SEORS, S capital S E O R S, and that's where you'll find side event information. You'll also see links for mandated events, something that's mandated out of a COP decision, so it's not a side event per se. But you'll also find the annotated agendas for each of these bodies that Jen laid out at the beginning, at the top of the hour. So for the COP, the CMP, the protocol entity, the COP. The protocol, the CMA for the agreement, and then the subbody, Substan SBTI. If you click on those agendas, especially if you start at the subbodies, that's where you're going to find the more granular agenda items that will relate to your interests. And here's the pro tip. Then after you see it on the agenda, skip down to the bottom where the annotations are. And that's where you're going to find synthesis reports like the one I mentioned uh, on the NDC synthesis in September. You're going to find uh, draft recommendations. You're going to find the products, for example, if you're looking at finance for the biennial assessment report for the Jen mentioned out of the Standing Committee on Finance, basically everything you could want. And because I'll return back to what Jen said, while the UK presidency on its website has its campaigns, and I like the cash, et cetera, I hadn't heard it said that way. Um, you, um, at the UNF Triple C site, you're going to have to dig a little deeper because that's what's going on in the negotiations. So those annotations will show you how, for example, the Coronivia joint work on agriculture. So ag will pop up on your alt F search when you're on that page. But then you got to look at the annotations to see what they're actually doing at the COP or in uh, Substa at that time. That's, that's how you'll go forward. And I think you'll get more, I don't know, meat, tofu, uh, whereas the campaigns are a little more comms oriented. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think between all, across all your answers, people should have plenty of homework to do to dive in. Um, so the next topic I wanna dive into is how science is integrated into the COP process. So specifically, um, we saw that the most recent um, element of the IPCC's uh, six assessment report came out not too long ago. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how these IPCC reports and other scientific reports feed into what happens at the COP and more broadly how science is integrated or not into different parts of the negotiations. And we also got a, a audience question that feeds into this, so I'll share that as well, um, that we've perhaps are warming faster than some of these uh, reports and past reports have shown or modeled. So how do we integrate new projections or how do new projections inform global stock take, ratcheting up ambition, those sorts of things. 
Um, maybe we can start with Derek. Um, and then <laughs> that was a lot of questions. So I, I'll, we can pause for a moment too for everyone to have a chance. But um, maybe we'll start with Derek and then jump to Jen and to Tracy. Yeah. Um, others may have uh, sort of a more, more comprehensive answer than I can offer. But, um, you know, it's uh, the IPCC. Uh, summary of the science uh, has been sort of the guide star for the negotiations uh, from the beginning um, in the framework, under the framework convention of climate change. Uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, Article 4, uh, the, the goal that's stipulated there to uh, achieve a balance between emissions and removals by the middle of the century in order to uh, you know, limit global warming well below two degrees and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. I think reflects uh, the progression of the science up to the Paris Agreement, where, uh, you know, for, for I would say for you know a decade or more, the goal was really uh, the conversations were more around two degrees. And I think you know, with respect to the one comment that uh, suggests we may be warming faster than we expected, that's reflected in this uh, Paris Agreement goal. Um, and I think you know most of the conversation uh, in the last few years has really been. That, you know, the Paris Agreement says as close as possible to 1.5. Um, you know, everyone's talking about 1.5, and I think that's going to be reflected in the, in the global stock take. Um, there are, you know, some larger questions around um, the you know, netting of emissions uh, with removals. Um, the AR6, well, there was a report two years ago, three years ago, the IPCC 1.5 degree report suggesting different pathways by which that could be achieved. Um, AR6 is sort of coming in with a, some updates on the science there. Uh, we don't have the working group three report, which is about implementation, which is uh, unfortunate, I think, going into this cup. Um, but, uh, but it's, you know, the, um, the scientific understanding that's been raised in those reports, I think is very much informing how folks are thinking about the upcoming global stock take, for example. Yeah, I think I'll just add a couple uh, flag points, maybe in terms of what is on the agenda. Um, there is an agenda item called uh, the long term review of the adequacy of the global goal, which is, is it still uh, is a two or 1.5 degree goal adequate and and this was initially conducted 2013 to 2015 and it was one of the main reasons why we see 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement that they sort of managed to talk about 1.5 in a way that other countries could actually agree to. And so that's actually happening again. And we'll have a lot of scientific input. Uh, the global stock take, like Derek mentioned, is going to have at least a year long, maybe an 18 month long uh, scientific phase. And so we've had these structured expert dialogues for this long term review. And we're having uh, the scientific phase for the global stock take, which actually will start next year. So there's a lot of input to get more science into the system. Um, I mean, to some extent, we already know what many of the issues are. And so the science just adds the urgency to it. Uh, but yeah, there's going to be an awful lot of opportunities for scientists at, at future COPs. And just to tag team with Jen, that first item is a fascinating one. And and, and as she pointed out, it moved the dial or the needle on the dial on 1.5. So that is taking place. And I'm pretty sure that's under the Substa agenda. So for those of you who recall my pro tip about annotated agendas, go to the substantive agenda and look at that. Um, and then second, uh, Jen, I also think of the, the standing Substa agenda item on research and systematic observation. So that's an area where those folks gather and um, um, do work and set out a work plan for educating uh, policymakers um, on the latest science. And then I guess the last thing, and I have to be honest, I didn't attend this at 25, but there is that Earth Day, and I'm pretty sure that's a mandated event where essentially it's a, it's a teach-in um, with quite a few scientists. It's not just the IPCC, or I shouldn't say that, it's not just what we think about in terms of warming. For example, I heard it about in terms of the cryosphere report and a lot of the cryosphere scientists who were there but it's intended to be an opportunity to make it very easy for policymakers in residence at the COP to take up this information and to discuss it 
with the people who are were writing these reports. And that's going to happen this year. I just don't know the day. Oh, I'm sorry, last two things. The COP presidency, to be fair, they're having a science and innovation day. Uh, so all the programming at the there, the UK pavilion in the blue zone. And I think that's Tuesday, that's the 9th, November 9th, it's Tuesday of the second week. And then I'll put in a plug for Ringo, the research and independent NGOs. Uh, we are hosting a research and action thematic day the next day, Wednesday, November 10th, and featuring quite a few Ringo members whose side events have been selected on that day. So keep an eye out for that, Wednesday, November 10th. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, we are getting a lot of questions from the audience. So I'm gonna interject real quick with one that I think is interesting uh, because I think it um, gets at something that is part of a lot of conversations on or around Capitol Hill. And that's the idea of a net zero commitment. Um, and so uh, the, the, the question goes like this, um, within the context of achieving net zero emissions in the coming decades, what is the ratio of tons of carbon sequestered to tons emitted that are sort of being negotiated or being discussed at COP26. And I think as you think about sort of your response, I think that's a really great question because um, that's very much a conversation in Washington. And I think it's very, and I'm, I'm very interested in what your responses are to it because I think sometimes what's happening here domestically talking about net zero goals, how does it relate to what's actually being talked about at that high level at COP26. And Jen, I think if it's all right, I'd like to start with you and then we'll hear from Derek and then uh, for sure give Tracy an opportunity to weigh in as well. Sure. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing about this is that it won't be talked about at COP uh, in terms of what net zero is. So uh, the Paris Agreement says to achieve a balance between emissions and removals. It doesn't say net zero. We've been calling it net zero ever since. Uh, so what that balance is, if it's we keep emitting like crazy and plant, you know, forests like we've never seen before, or if we have reduced emissions rapidly and don't need to do a lot of offsets or tree planting, um, both those things count right now because we're just achieving a balance. So uh, there is no effort right now to define net zero beyond that. Yeah, um, I, I would just add that uh, I think a big reason for that is what Tracy was talking about, um, that the Paris Agreement is, is a bottom-up uh, kind of regime. Um, so it's up to you know, each individual country to put forward what their pledge is for mitigation, mitigating emissions um, or in, you know, investing in carbon dioxide removal, for example. Um, and I think that this is a big question going forward, right? It's, because the Paris Agreement is not top down, we can't sort of stipulate, at least under the way it's framed today, um, what that global balance should be and how it's allocated uh, amongst different countries. It's up to countries to kind of come together and agree on uh, a, a common approach uh, and then individually what, what their uh, approach will be that's in line with that. So um, so yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. It's also a, a big challenge. Yeah, and I, I would add two points, one on the country definitions and the country negotiations. I do agree that obviously bottom up a self determination or self differentiation, but I also think there's some appetite to talk about this a little more seriously because of what happened under the Kyoto Protocol and there not being limits on what developed countries, Annex One countries could bring back from the CDM, for example. I mean, that, that was actively discussed in the run up to Kyoto and um, the decision. And so I, I do feel there's appetite there. Uh, what I wanna throw out that's a little outside here though, but certainly something that um, I think Hill staffers would know about is that there's a fairly robust um, private market, right? The um, carbon markets, the voluntary effort. So Jen, for example, in the intro talked about non-state actors in this space and their increasing presence um, and they're being called on. So for example, the Global Climate Action, it's now called, it's had different names over the years. There are two high level champions, one from the UK, one from the COP25 presidency from Chile. And they are all about um, getting businesses to be as ambitious or more ambitious than the countries that they're, than they're headquartered in. 
That's everything from scope one, scope two, scope three emissions to manage that. Um, and so they are driving these voluntary carbon markets, but the definition problem is an issue, right? So we, Jen, you mentioned, you know, what does net zero mean? It's not actually in the Paris Agreement that way, but many are saying Paris aligned, uh, right? It, you know, it gets back to like food labeling, what's organic versus natural versus, and so I'm raising this because there's a very active a number of credentialing authorities or entities that want to prom promote standards for high integrity VCMs. And they're going to be hanging out at the UK pavilion in the blue zone talking quite a bit during this COP. So I guess what I'm saying is, is one of the things we could look at is what's happening in the private space, whether consumers are demanding it or industry is responding to other exhortation and how definitions might evolve there that could reflect what's going on um, in the negotiations or informant down the road. Thanks for that. And as you were, um, as you were, the three of you were providing your answers, we had another question came in that I think is uh, another thing that's on people's minds. And that is if, if something like net zero is, is basically in the eye of the beholder, each country can sort of maybe settle on a definition of balance for, that works for itself. What do you, what do we say to folks who might say, well, um, U.S. efforts to reduce emissions, you know, they may not have, be as impactful um, when compared because of what other countries are doing. So if if we're doing what we can do and other countries are making their own determinations about what they can do in terms of their contributions, um, you know, what are the it's basically, I think, a way to say there may be a downside to a bottom up approach. Um, I don't know if anyone has any responses to that. I'm not suggesting that necessarily is where ESI is coming from, but I think it's an interesting question and I'm positive that it's being asked in, in US policy circles. Um, yeah, wait, uh, I mean, how do you answer that? Climate change is, is you know, inherently um, and unavoidably a collective action problem, um, right? So. Uh, how do you tackle that? Um, we don't have a global government. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, under Kyoto, um, we did manage to agree an approach, although the United States did not participate, um, that would set binding emissions limits on industrialized countries, the ones that had contributed most to the problem. Um, that's had, I would say, mixed results. Um, the, you know, and it quickly became clear, you know, as recently as 15 years ago, as long ago as 15 years ago, um, that, uh, that that would be, not be enough, um, especially if we look at the growth in emissions in China, India, uh, other parts of the developing world. So, um, you know, the, the big uh, advance, the big step forward with Paris was to, you know, create a regime that was inclusive, globally inclusive. Um, and I think that's no small feat that you have basically every country in the world committing something. Um, but, uh, but yeah, then you, then you run into the question of, all right, so how do we make sure this all heads up? And that's, that's where these provisions around um, the reporting, the transparency, the ratcheting up of innovation, the global stock take come in. Um, they're designed to push things forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all contingent upon uh, you know, the goodwill uh, and cooperation of, of, of countries. Um, and that's maybe where Article 6 comes in as well, that it provides a mechanism for, um, you know, uh, countries to achieve more aggressive targets themselves, but also work with other countries to bring, you know, motivate private finance into clean technologies, uh, or low carbon development and things of that nature that can help make it easier. Um, for uh, the developing world, for example, to set more ambitious targets um, and uh, ensure that what we're doing is part of a, a successful global effort. Tracy or Jen, do you have any thoughts that you would like to add to, to Derek's answer, which I thought was a great answer, actually. Thank you for that. Jen, I was going to give you the last word. <laughs> well, I, 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 um, I apologize. I had to answer a knock at the door there for a moment behind me. But um, I, I do, Dan, the way you phrased it, it, it sounded hauntingly familiar to when the Senate uh, said that they would never pass the uh, or, or ratify the Kyoto 
Kyoto Protocol, right? Because China wasn't one of the Annex One countries that would have targets underneath it. So now everybody is all in. And, um, you know, it could be a race to the bottom or it could be a race to the top with ambition. And that's why it takes so many nuanced, I think, pieces to it. So Article Six will bring in a sector of countries that are going to, in theory, and I think in reality, increase their ambition if, second, consumers in the developed world give recognition for why China's greenhouse gas emissions are so high, given all the products that we have that are labeled on the back of our necks um, from China. So I think there's that consumer movement and that growing awareness, which then has placed um, uh, companies um, on a wide spectrum um, to, to make, you know, fairly credible commitments and to, and to retool how they uh, produce and deliver the products that we want. So, you know, I, I think it's messy and I understand that that's, uh, especially if you're in the United States where you have a constitution and statutes and regulations and courts and, you know, it, it looks a little more top down that way. Um, but that's the nation and nature of international relations. So we're trying to find the individual pieces that hook people in and that we can hold people, countries and hold them accountable based on their interests. And that's what the NDC bottom-up approach is trying to do. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks, Derek. Yeah, Jen, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, I agree with all of that. Um, and yeah, we have a bottom-up approach because it allows all to participate. And one of the main reasons why we have a bottom-up approach is so that the US could participate. Uh, so it's a matter of catching everybody and, and that reporting bit will be crucial. I will add, there's this weird quirk to international relations, just putting my uh, lecturer of IR hat on, uh, that compliance is surprisingly high, even when there isn't a stick making countries do it. Uh, we don't know why, we haven't answered that question, but it's this really wonderful pattern that hopefully will work in our favor. Thanks, Jen. And we are at time, but we are going to fit in one more question anyway. Um, <laughs> and we're going to call it a lightning round. So we'll give you like one or two sentences each, but um, want to, yeah, set your timer, Tracy. Um, but of course, success is defined differently by every different stakeholder you might ask who's involved in this process. Um, but from your perspective, um, what would be one outcome that we could look for during and as COP um, wraps up in just a couple weeks from now that if we see it, we might consider there to have been some success. So maybe, um, Jen, we could start with you, then we will go to Derek and we'll wrap with Tracy. Uh, I'm going to cheat and say two things. Uh, one is that we have as near a complete Paris rule book as possible, even if they don't get all those details, we have confidence that they will have them all wrapped up, wrapped up really soon. Uh, and the second that those leaders leave with the sense that they actually need to start making sure they hit those targets that they've promised. Um, well, I can keep it short. Uh, agreement on Article 6, on that Article 6 rule book. Um, I think it's not just the um, you know, getting the rule book completed. I think it's this symbolic value of that is uh, tremendous. Uh, and so um, even if they have to compromise a little bit, uh, which would be unfortunate if they don't, but, uh, but I think it's really important to get that done after two, two cops where it was not agreed. So I um, will draft on the good choices of Jen and Derek and add, um, going back to what I talked about, is that there are more ambitious NDCs that are announced at the World Leaders Summit, and that yes, Jen, they leave knowing that they have, they're now in the books and it's going up to the registry. And hopefully what that means is that those negotiators who were uh, below those folks who are speaking now have different red lines or they're not so red and so then can negotiate. And then I think it's cli-fi in the end. It's, I think that to make this really happen, there needs to be some type of credible path beyond 100 billion, which is the, you know, starting those negotiations right now, and that it cannot be all concessional. And, and that we have to show that what the world did to react to the pandemic and how there was quite a bit of collaboration and work across borders that we can do the same on climate change because certainly the developing world which right now is not benefiting from the vaccines that those of us in the developed world have been able to get 
um, they see that there's a divide and, um, and they're bringing that to the negotiations in particular on finance. And if we in the developed world don't see that, we're not gonna get what we all just said was important to come out of COP26. I'd love to see that happen. Well, that is a great place to end, Tracy. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, Anna, uh, for leading an amazing Q&A. Thank you, Jen, Derek, and Tracy for your incredible presentations today. Um, I, it's always great to, I, I learned so much from, from these webinars and today was really no exception. Um, I'm all ready for COP26. Um, everybody at EESI is all ready for COP26. Um, we will be taking a couple, We'll be taking a little bit of a break briefings wise. Um, you can see that our next briefing is not scheduled until November 18th. That's when we will uh, have our recap of COP26 key outcomes and what comes next. Um, the reason for that little bit of a break um, is because COP26 will be happening um, and we have a daily newsletter to get out. Um, so we uh, will be working very hard on that to get Glas Glasgow Dispatch out every day. Um, please. Um, uh, take a moment to visit us online at www.esi.org. Uh, when you do, you can sign up for our Climate Change Solutions new newsletter that comes out every two weeks. Um, you can also sign up for the daily newsletter, Glasgow Dispatch. You can also access the presentations uh, that Jen, Derek, and Tracy presented. Um, you can also watch an archive of the webcast. Um, this was a really great session and um, um, there was a, a tremendous amount of content communicated in the last 96 minutes. And, no doubt there's a lot to benefit, a lot of benefit in going back and looking at it again. Um, I would also like to um, acknowledge that this briefing series would not be possible without our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington. And it would definitely not be possible without our wonderful partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. So thank you uh, to the British Embassy Washington and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for your generous support. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to um, plug our survey. You can see on the screen right now, there is a link if you have uh, two moments, two minutes, um, if you're willing to take the survey, it's a huge help for us. If you had any uh, audio issues, video issues, if you have thoughts um, that you would like to share, um, please feel free to um, take a few moments and fill out that survey. We read every response um, and um, it means a lot that you um, help us improve our offerings. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge the audience today. Um, we had probably the most robust audience Q&A uh, we weren't able to get to everybody, unfortunately, but we were able to integrate some of the questions into our discussion. But thank you to our, our online audience today for um, helping us um, navigate the Q&A. And finally, um, I would just like to thank everybody at ESI who makes these briefings possible. Uh, Dan O'Brien, Omri Laporte, Emma Johnson, Anna McGinn, Amber Todoroff, and Savannah Bertrand. We also have three awesome interns this semester, Isabella, Valerie, and Roshni. They're huge helps and uh, we couldn't do it without them. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we're a couple minutes over, apologies for that, um, but um, thought it was worth having that little bit of extra lightning round um, at the end there. So I wish everyone a happy Friday afternoon and a great weekend. And to those traveling to COP26, safe travels. And uh, we will see everybody back on November 18th for the recap or the recop as I like to call it, our key outcomes and what comes next. Thanks everybody.